Centers, Scott in grade DC across from the Marion Center between TSC and Kroger. For further information, dial 740-386-6580. Also located on the net at goodbackbadback.com. That's goodbackbadback.com. along with you on a Thursday edition of The Exchange, joined by Charlie Evers, Mary Ann Michaels, Brenda Donigan, Martha Dousman AC, and Shannon O'Neill. Yesterday's quizzer question, which uh, this panel did not give you much help with, who would name the actor who portrayed the fat man in Jake and the Fat Man, the TV series. It was Robert Conrad, who was also canon for many years on television. I like Jake and the Fat Man. I have the DVD at home. It's a, kind of a funny show, kind of a neat little thing. Uh, we're going to start off this Thursday by going to Charlie for fascinating facts. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I was just thinking about some fascinating facts. <laughs> and I forgot. <laughs> you forgot it. <laughs> That's typical uh, when you get a little bit older. You know, this week, Charlie, when I went to you and when the doctor, I feel like I'm playing password. You yeah. say that thing, that name, that, that guy. Right. Boy, isn't it? It's something. It kind of scary almost. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're thinking about something and all of a sudden it leaves. Maybe your tie's too tight. Oh, loosen it up. That's oh, a nice tie. Well, yeah, there's Pluto and Pluto, Mickey and Mouse and all those guys. Donald Duck. Yeah. Charlie, why don't you, since you've forgotten your facts today, your faculties, <laughs> yeah. tell everybody what this box is behind you. This make Mary Ann cringe, but oh. go ahead. You tell them today. Well, it, it says, uh, what, what does it say on the front? Uh, it says, uh, enter if you dare. Yes. And so I'm supposed to enter that to, on Halloween. Halloween! And find a surprise in there. Did you zoom in on the skeleton? Did you see the skeleton over here? Yes, Charlie? I saw the skeleton. Yes, yes I saw Dr. Gray. Yes! Yes. That and skeleton is in good posture. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> kind of a limp thing. Uh, but, uh, well, it might be kind of interesting. Uh, it, it, is it going to be anything like those people that come out of uh, cakes, you know? Oh, you want a woman to come out of a cake <laughs> behind you? I oh, hope Charlie, I hope your wife's not watching. <laughs> Holy mackerel. In your dreams, Charlie. Yeah, no, I can imagine, right. Yeah. Marianne, did you forget the words of wisdom today, or do we have words of wisdom? Yes, we have words of well, wisdom. Well, Charlie's already let me down. It's Thursday. <laughs> We're already on a let down. All right. Well, this is a good one from Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the most people, one of the women that I really admire, uh, and this is what she says, friendship with oneself is important because without it, one cannot have friends with anyone else in the world. You know, you have to like yourself first, and that's true, and a lot of people don't like themselves first, and really, you need to. I you need to see something in your life that you know that you're good doing, and like yourself. Loved Eleanor Roosevelt. Anytime yes. I can read anything or watch anything on Me her, lady. I make sure to do it. Fascinating woman. Uh, Buckeye Cluck has returned. It, Dr. Gray put him there this time. I put him on that end of the table this week, Marianne. But Buckeye Cluck's back in your shot. He loves you. It's a relationship the two of you have. We're not going to go over to Brenda Duck. May I move, Dr. Duck? Is it Dr. Duck? No, it's Buckeye Cluck. Buckeye Cluck. Buckeye Cluck. Buckeye Cluck. That's earlier on, like you turned Humphrey Bogart into Hoagie Chavez or something. Brenda, Brenda, what was it you did earlier on in the week, Marianne? Humphrey Bogart, and you said it was Hoagie... Hoagie Carmichael. Hoagie Carmichael. Okay. Oh, no, he'll never let me... <laughs> Clears it all right. I bet Brenda remembers Stardust. <laughs> no, <you're not. laughs> I, I bet I she doesn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Hoagie Carmichael yeah. was famous for playing it. Yeah. Oh, is that who made it? Okay. And there you go. I know Jim and I danced to it a few years ago at Christmas at the Palace or oh. whatever with uh, six or eight other couples, so... 
Brenda, what's on our agenda today? Well, we're, we're going to stay at home. Oh, good. You know, we have a lot in Marion to offer, and uh, so I thought we would talk about a few things here. And the first place that I thought we would start is down on um, West Center Street at the Ballast Theater. Uh, you know, it's the uh, John Eberson design and opened in 1928 as a vaudeville theater. Mm -hmm. And about once a year, the theater usually has a silent movie, and a, I can't remember the organist's name, darn it, I've got Charlie's disease now. He's from Detroit. Detroit, yeah. Yes. Uh, but he comes down and he plays music set to that, that movie, and it, it's really interesting to go and watch it. Um, until you go to that, you really can't identify with how they enjoyed silent movies, because from what I understand, that was how all silent movies were interpreted back then. And of course, we have the Mighty Words are there at uh, the palace that everybody loves to come and listen to. And it's a surprise to a lot of first-time visitors when it comes up out of the pit mm -hmm. uh, to the platform, and they play, and then if they go back down again. So um, I was um, privileged to be a part of uh, the cast of The Singing Cowboy, which made a uh, world premiere showing of The Singing Cowboy the past two weekends or a couple weekends ago. And uh, just wanted to be a part of history. And when Tina asked me, I jumped at the chance, and we did it. So that's behind us now. Okay, we're going to go on down the street to promo cost costumes. Uh, I think Marion is so fortunate to have locally a uh, company that comes and they take your ideas, you give them the ideas of what you want, or they have their own ideas of costumes for mascots, uh, maybe your, a logo of some kind, or just a fiction character, or whatever. And it's really fascinating to go there and watch them. You know, all you have to do is give them a call, and they're more than happy to show you the whole process through there. But they really have come up with amazing costumes in uh, the years. I don't know how many employees they have. Uh, I didn't get a chance to call Dan, but it um, looks like about six or eight, maybe, that I've seen when I've been in there for tours. The unfortunate thing with promo is it's not handicap friendly. Uh, you do have stairs to climb, and, or you can take a freight elevator up. So. But it's a very, very nice place to visit. Kids, especially if they're working on any, any kind of cartoon costumes, would be really interested in that. Now we're going to go on down Center Street to the Marion Union Station. And did you know that Marion has more than 100 trains that pass through here every day? Mm. That's why when you come from the west, <laughs> you need to allow extra time. So if you get stopped at the train tracks there, you've got time to make it to your appointment. And at the, uh, they worked on it for, oh my goodness, probably 20 years plus, restoring and, and uh, getting a museum in, pay in place. And uh, one of the things that a lot of railroaders or former railroaders like to do is come to the AC Tower and watch the um, trains go by. And I understand that there are people down there nearly every weekend who bring lawn chairs and just sit there and watch trains. Now I could find more interesting things to do, but they, a lot of people, uh, especially former railroaders, find a lot of pleasure in that. Cool. Okay, then we're going to leave there. We're going to go north uh, up to Marion County Fairgrounds where we find the Huber Museum. And um, they've got all kinds of bits and pieces and memorabilia and whatever inside. And then outside they have two or three shovels. Of course, the Hubers were uh, the founders of Marion Power Shovel, which had a part in uh, space history as well with the uh, building of the crawlers that carried the shovels out. Lift off, and uh, there's, I don't know, you really need a curator when you're there because I didn't understand everything that I saw, but then I don't know a lot about big machinery, but it was interesting to be in there. And then uh, once we see that, we're going to go up Route 4, which is close by to Lynn School. This school was restored uh, back to its original status back in 1897 when it was built. The Hamilton brothers had the school restored inside and out the way that it was when they attended that school. And they spent, I don't know, hundreds, about hundreds of thousands probably to restore that building. And uh, 
visitors are transported back to a place in time when they had ten lunch pails and bench seats, whatever you call them, the recitation seats. Mm -hmm. uh, teacher, help me out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the pop belly stove and uh, desks that had ink wells in them. Uh, I remember them when I was in school and I wondered what they were because, um, well, when I was in elementary, yes, they were still using uh, a pen that you had to put the thing down in there and fill up. You, you guys understand my English. Yes, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> I understand the inkwells. Yes, yes the inkwells. Full of ink. <laughs> but uh, I don't remember. I guess even before that, they used just a pen that they dipped in. That's right. Whatever they and then you there. dipped the uh, pigtails of the girls sitting in front of you in there. Oh, that would have. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, Charlie, you're telling yourself. <laughs> <laughs> they even have some McGuffey readers out there. So it's just a real interesting trip, especially uh, uh, if your children have never had the opportunity to see a one-room school and, and uh, an old-time school. So uh, that, again, you might want to call um, the Historical Society and and uh, set up a, a tour there. They have a couple of ladies who go out there and they, they're dressed in period clothing and they just are through it and even uh, do a couple of school lessons from what I understand. So when you come back to town, if you come in on Route 423, you might want to stop at Stewart's Root Beer and have a Cooney dog or a big tenderloin and curly fries and a root beer. Or you can come on through town uh, to Main Street and go to Barry's. Is that how you say their name, Charlie? That's right. Really good food there. A couple from Argentina run that small restaurant, but it's very, very good food. And that's it for today. Brenda, I'm glad you mentioned that. First, because of the Lynn School. I know Charlie mentioned that once before. What a great asset that is oh, by the is. Hamilton brothers. Mm -hmm. And also, when you said Coney Dog, did you know that the term Coney Dog is... Um, if you go other places, they have no idea what that means. I know. Yeah, I, I went, I, I didn't, I thought Coney Dog, I that's, everybody knows what that means. I took a trip to Manhattan one time, and I was coming back, and I was in New Jersey, and I stopped at a Dairy Queen, and uh, asked for a Coney Dog, and they said, what's a Coney Dog? Mm -hmm. It's a chili dog everywhere else in the world, apparently. I don't know. Was it taken from Coney Island? I, I think so. I think but it was. I know that's true because our daughter that lives in the eastern panhandle, West Virginia, she and her friend uh, oversee the uh, concession stand uh, down from their housing development. And uh, she started offering coney dogs, and people were going, what in the world are those? <laughs> and so they had to put beans on them and cheese, and then they would buy them. So she, it became the most popular thing that they sold out of the concession stand after that. I wish you grow up. knew what they were. You grow up and you think everybody knows that word. That's just <laughs> common talk, but it's, it's really not. How much time do we have left in the program today? I think we've got enough time to get into a current event. We haven't done that this week. Let's do that today. Uh, Self-describe, we have the Tea Party can, um, movement early on, early on. Tea Party. Tea Party. Oh, oh. oh Charlie, like you never butchered a word. Don't, don't start with me. <laughs> Here we go. Self-described troublemaker Christine O'Donnell appeared on the uh, Piers Morgan Tonight Show trying to talk about her book, Troublemaker, Let's Do What It Takes to Make America Great Again. O'Donnell, a Tea Party favorite, is best known for in Delaware for defeating the heavily favored nine-term congressman and former governor, Michael Castle, in the state's September 2010 Republican Senate primary. Mary. She lost in the general election to Democrat Chris Coons. Outside of Delaware, she is perhaps most famous for her claim to have once dabbled into witchcraft and her subsequent ad in which she disclaimed possessing supernatural abilities. Before coming on Morgan's show, she had already told Good Morning America that she regretted the I'm Not a Witch campaign ad. She said experts told her to do the ad and that she had since learned to trust your gut. The trouble started when Morgan asked O'Donnell about part of her book that discussed gay marriage. That's when O'Donnell accused him of borderline being a little bit rude. O'Donnell repeatedly urged Morgan to drop the topic of gay rights, but Morgan would not back down, asking another question about the Pentagon's repeal of its don't ask, don't tell policy. Morgan at one point looked as though he was trying to hold back a smile and insisted, I think I'm being rather charming and respectful. O'Donnell said the gay marriage issue is not relevant or what she is championing, saying the book is meant to inspire the Tea Party movement to bring America back to the second American Revolution. O'Donnell began looking off camera while asserting that Morgan should try to ask 
her what she told him she wanted to talk about. At one point, O'Donnell claimed she was being pulled away as a handler tried to block the camera. Morgan, for his part, didn't look particularly invested or bothered when he asked, where are you going, you're leaving, as O'Donnell removed her microphone and asked Morgan if he'd read the book, to which she said, yes, but those issues are in your book. That's my point. You do talk about them. Then O'Donnell ended the interview. Okay, well that was all over last week, you couldn't escape that, and uh, kind of interesting because we've always said that CNN is kind of middle of the road. I don't, I, I couldn't guess what Piers Morgan's politics are, uh, but uh, apparently Christine O'Donnell had a big problem with what he was asking. Well, Why do you think that was? She, she wanted him to ask her questions, and you know, when you're being interviewed, you don't tell people what kind of questions to ask, usually. But she wanted him only to ask questions about the book, and uh, apparently he didn't. Uh, so well, I'm she walked off the program. But then afterwards, she she said she didn't walk off the program. So Well, the interesting know. thing is, is, I've never read the book, but he said th this was in the book. She just said it was something she's not championing right now. Well, I don't know. That's a possibility. That's a little shaky, though, to mm -hmm. me. What do you think, Shannon? Maybe she was afraid of putting her foot in her mouth again. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, with the whole witchcraft thing, mm -hmm. immediately when you say Christine O'Donnell, that's the only thing I can mm -hmm. think of. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably true for the rest of the public. Mm -hmm. Forget about her ever having a career in politics, right. let's be honest. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> what does this do for her to do this? I mean, at some point, doesn't common sense set in and you realize you're on CNN, you're around the world, mm -hmm. and they're going to show this if you get up and walk off the set? I mean, is she really uh, that politically unastute? I think that these politicians so rely on their handlers. Well, my handlers told me to do this. My handlers told me to do that. And I think that really a handler can possibly make or break your career in politics. I think that they're too attached. Mm -hmm. Could be. Mm -hmm. Brenda, what do you think? I agree with her. The first thing when you said that was I thought about the witchcraft and I thought, ooh. And even when I heard that she was considering running for an office, I thought, gosh, I don't think she'll get too far. Mm -hmm. But then um, I must have been out of the world last week because I didn't see any of this. <laughs> but then again, my husband doesn't often let me watch CNN. <laughs> oh, well, you know, the, the interesting thing is, though, about this, uh, it, I think it happened on Wednesday night. Piers Morgan re-ran the episode Friday, re-ran the episode Sunday, mm -hmm. and talked about it quite a bit. It yes. got him quite a, quite a bit of ratings, and I don't think did too well for her book sales. He's trying to establish himself as the next... Uh, Man, he Here we go again, Charles. Yes, word. Red. I don't know what he's doing. The, uh, the next Larry King. Yeah, the next Larry King. He's doing this uh, on purpose. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about him, would we? Right. Had he not well, he can't on, conduct an interview like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, but he can't on purpose make somebody walk off. No, but he could sure... If he knew the person, he could pretty well tell that something was going to happen. Well, is that a, a touchy subject? I mean, do you think what he said was wrong? I don't know. Piers Morgan, like I say, is trying to make a reputation for himself as a controversial figure like Larry King, and uh, he apparently is succeeding. But he's using his guests to propel himself. I don't know if Larry... Is he an American citizen? Uh, I don't know. He's from... He's a lion, isn't he? Yeah, but you know, I don't think Larry King was ever controversial. No. He, he didn't ask controversial... He wasn't like Ask one of his wives. Well, that's something different. I don't think he, I don't think he can fill Larry King's status. I think he's trying to be the interviewer who asks tough questions. Mm -hmm. You know, Barbara Walters got a rap for years for asking questions like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think what he asked was all that horrible. I don't either. I, mean, I don't but understand I why she walked off. Well, some people, uh, you know, uh, when they're on a program, they want to uh, sell their book and they want to talk about the book. And uh, But apparently he took something out of that book that she wasn't willing to expand upon. So I think that was the problem. Didn't Larry King have a walkout? He did, but it was that ditzy... Uh, cuckoo girl who said that he was being... They always think you're being inappropriate. Well, what do you think you're going to? It's an interview. That's right. I mean, do you think it's you a conversation? Be, you, know, you should Come be on. ready for everything, I would I would assume. That's right. And we, having been yeah. a, a politician. We had talked before about people 
that didn't want to go to the uh, Tea Party uh, get-togethers, I mean, or forums, uh, because they were afraid they'd be uh, against them. Mm -hmm. Well, if you know what you're doing, you could go up against anybody. That's, you, that shouldn't be a problem. No, I agree. you should be intelligent. Well, it. that used to be the case, though, Charlie, but I'll tell you something. If you say something that is totally taken out of context, and one of these news stations, news organizations, anybody, takes what you, a little clipping of yes, what you said, yeah. and then you try to deny, you can't deny you said it, mm -hmm. but it's hard to go back and say, but I said it in regard to this. A lot of somebody's are, not there. Yeah, a lot of things are taken out of context, and that's not fair, really. Hey, then keep a little recording in your pocket wherever you go. <laughs> well, see, and that's the paranoia of the world now, though, is that you people will throw a camera in your face, people mm -hmm. will throw a phone in your face. You never know what audience you're going to be out. I, I don't have a. I think that's crazy. Uh, it's her right to walk off, but I think I don't think he did anything inappropriate. Does anybody think he did anything inappropriate? I didn't watch the program, so I really can't. You know, I can't be honest about it. I just know what I've heard. But I didn't actually see the program, so I think you almost have to have seen it in order to make some kind of a judgment, an honest judgment. Do you remember, it's probably been, gosh, 20 years ago now, but do you remember when Mike Wallace was doing 60 Minutes at the height of it? And he did an interview with Barbara Streisand, and they played the footage that they normally don't play, where he was asking Barbara about not having good relationships with men, not having good relationships with her mother, and Barbara was crying and said, would you like to see me this way? And I remember, I'll never forget, he said, what did you think, Barbara, this was gonna be, and then you made this movie, and then you did this. When you're doing an interview, you can't dictate what questions are gonna be asked. That's true. But then some of the questions are, um, you know, they want them to be controversial because it's, it gets more buzz from somebody. But I'd like to go back to what Charlie said, though, because there was a lady in Washington, and I'm going to get Charlie's disease here, too, because her name was Kay something, but she was a, a brilliant Washington journalist. She wrote a book, and I'll never forget, it was one of the first books I ever read in, in broadcasting. There's no such thing as an indiscreet question because the person always has the right to refuse to answer it. Yes, that's true. That's true. That's a good. That's and very I, good. And I, uh, Kay, what was her name? Well, she, she was, was a, a publisher. Book. She was a publisher. Publisher, but it, was, but it wasn't. It wasn't the Washington Post lady. Oh, that's uh, it was right. Kay. Uh, it'll come to me hopefully mm -hmm. later on. But it's a brilliant book. Yeah, same for what? I am. I'm sitting yeah. rubbing off. It's contagious. Let's go into the mailbag real quick because it's a very simple question before we do the quizzer. Uh, what do you like in? What do you like in TV news today? Marie and Marion. What do you? What do you watch? Shannon, if you're going to watch any kind of news, what do you watch? I really don't care too much for television news. To be honest with you, I think it's a lot of show. Um, and it's a lot of opinion. It's not really hard news facts. I actually really enjoy a publication called The Week. Uh, take a look at it sometime, Scott. Tell me what you think of it. It's, it's unbiased. It presents all, all sides and covers all the issues that we really should be talking about. Great stuff. Good. Mm -hmm. Martha, what do you watch when you watch television news? Channel 4. Local. A lot of people are still in that local vein. Brenda, what do you do when it comes to news? I hit all of them. And try to take a little bit in from everything? Yeah, um, I have my favorites, that, but I won't say who. But um, I, I'd like to, if I can catch enough of them, I'd like to hear how they each relate the same story. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting, sometimes. sometimes Marianne, Marianne, Marianne. Oh, well, I'm a news hound, I am. And um, my husband criticizes me all the time. So I say, Didn't you just see that on the news? But I, I really do love the news, and um, I'm, I'm just news maybe because I was in the news at one time. But I do. But I also watch um, um, programs like NCIS and Covert Affairs, and um, uh, what's that one that takes place in the Hamptons that I like so well about this doctor. Uh, I love the ID channel. I do too. Oh, I think that's one of the best channels yes. there ever was. Charlie, what are you doing news? Well, I, I like, but I, I was in the radio for so long and so critical of stories that when I watch television news, I look for the mistakes they make. And uh, some of the young uh, newscasters uh, have their share, even though some of their material is not written by them. But I'm, I'm too critical, I guess, but I'm always looking for mistakes. Isn't that weird? I heard somebody one time call the McCarthy period the MacArthur period. I thought, well, there you go. Uh, we're going to get into the quizzer real quick before we run out of here. Daily Quizzer is brought to you by O. Michael's Fish and Chips. 
1116 Mount Vernon Avenue, right here in Marion, 725-3474. And if you're lucky enough to be the first person to answer today's quiz or question correct on the Exchange Marion's Facebook, you'll receive a free fish dinner for one at O'Michael's Fish and Chips. Quiz or question today, who was Bill Cosby's partner on the 1960s TV series I Spy? What was that actor's oh. name? Charlie? I have no idea. Oh. No idea. What do you think, Mary Ann? I used to watch that all the time, and I can see his face. I cannot think of his name. Brenda, do you remember that guy? No. Martha? I never watched Give that. me the initials. <laughs> no, I don't know. Sometimes I can think of things if I'm given the initials. Huh. Give me the initials. R.C. Was that a national show? Oh, yeah, I Spy. Oh, it was on yeah. NBC. Shannon, any guesses? No, Scott, all week long, questions I cannot answer. Not no, one. Not one, one guess. <laughs> wow. Marianne's in her own world. I don't know what's going on over here. We're going to be back on Friday, and we will have the answer for that. Who was Bill Cosby's partner on I Spy? We'll have that for you tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>